Okay, so I'm not gonna assume that you guys, uh, you know, know what are transformers or what is Lego. Okay, so my first task is to uh, explain to you uh, the terms in this uh, title. And of course, I'm not gonna talk, you know, about this kind of transformers uh, or this kind of Lego. Uh, sorry, you know, I have young kids at home. So for me, this, uh, this uh, picture means a lot. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, let's, let's get started and let's talk about transformers for real. So what are uh, transformers? Okay, so if, uh, if you go on Google and you search for transformer neural network, this is the picture that you're gonna see. Okay, and everybody will assume, yeah, this makes perfect sense, you know, you look, look, you know, there is a positional encoding, a multi-head attention, uh, you add, you normalize, there is a feed-forward network, then it feeds into this mass multi-head, etc. So good luck to understand, you know, based on, on this picture, but actually uh, what's going on is extremely simple and, and I will try to uh, explain to you uh, quickly. So there are two parts in this picture. There is the encoder and the decoder. We're gonna, figure, we're gonna focus our attention on the encoder part. I will briefly talk about decoder. Okay, so what are transformers exactly? They are uh, neural networks that contrary to you know, classical feed-forward neural network or convolutional neural network, instead of processing a single high dimensional input, they process a set of inputs. Okay, this is really the distinguishing feature between transformers and the other architecture is that they work with a set of inputs and each layer is gonna map such a set. Okay, so you have a set of L N element X1 up to Xn, a subset of Rd, and it's gonna map it to another set of N element X1 prime to Xn prime. And I need to explain to you just how this mapping you know, uh, proceeds. So how it proceeds is in two stages. The first one is using self-attention, which I will explain to you in a minute. So you first have, you know, you map your set to another set using self-attention. And then I'm gonna call each one of those element tokens. And each token is then processed by a feed-forward neural network. So then you have a classical, you know, feed-forward neural network, which is actually just a two-layer neural network, which processes, you know, in parallel all the tokens, okay? And then if you remember from the picture before, you know, uh, sorry. So you have this multi-head attention, which is gonna be the self-attention that I explained to you. And there is this residual and normalization uh, uh, connection. And then you see it goes through the feed forward and you repeat that operation n time. Okay, so this is uh, the transformer architecture. So really the only thing that I need to tell you besides, you know, the residual connection and the normalization, which I will not explain. I will just very briefly uh, tell you what is the layer normalization. Um, the residual connection is just that you add an identity map, you know, in top, on top of the self-attention and on top of the feed-forward neural network. But these are details, I mean, very important details that I don't want to, you know, obstruct what I'm uh, going to be talking about. So let me explain the main, really the main, the core element, which is the self-attention. So the self-attention is parameterized by three linear operators, WK, WQ, and WV, K for keys, Q for queries and V for values, okay? These three linear operators are gonna be applied to my tokens to transform them into a key view, a query view and a value view, okay? So let me denote K, little ki, which is WKXI, little qi, which is W, sorry, there is a typo, WQXI, and little vi, which is WVXI, okay? So I map my tokens into key uh, queries and values. And then you have this, uh, the following very simple formula, which you know, many people in the, in the theory community uh, will like, which is as follows. So what you do is, let's say you want to see how the ice token is gonna be transformed, okay? So the ice token, what I'm gonna look at is that I'm gonna try to see where to divide the attention of the ice token over the other tokens. And the way I'm gonna do that is that I'm gonna define a probability distribution, PI, Okay, so PI is gonna be a probability distribution on the index one to N. So it's gonna, you know, PI of J is gonna tell me how much token I is looking at token J. Okay, how much attention there is on token J. And to look at this, all I do is that I just look at the inner product between QI and KJ. Okay, so I look at, right now I'm looking at token I. I look at it, uh, token I through the query uh, view. Okay, so I look at QI. And then I see how QI correlates with the different keys of the different token. And then I just put that, you know, in this Gibbs type measure. Okay, I just put an exponential and a normalization constant. So this gives me a probability distribution. And now my, my transform token is just gonna be a weighted combination of the value view of the tokens weighted by these probabilities. 
Okay, does that make sense? This formula? And you know, W, just to be clear, you know, again, this is parameterized by WK, WQ, and WV. So when I do gradient descent, I'm going to be optimizing over, over those uh, three matrices. Yes, please. So if I have the dimension of WV is fixed, then you have the root to play for the T and the K. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, uh, so this is self attention with a single head. So it's an excellent question what you're saying. So this is with a single head. Now, what you do in transformers is that you have multiple heads, and this is going to be very important. And for computational reason, what you do is that those multiple heads, you know, they are in parallel, and each one of them is going to be in a lower dimensional space. So in fact, those operators, they are going to map from dimension D to dimension D over H, where H is the number of heads. Okay, so you basically decompose into different views, and each view is going to have its own, you know, attention head. Okay, so this is this is uh, this, these are transformers. Okay, yes. And, and is it really important to have different WK, WC, and WV? Or can just take one W? So uh, you're asking in practice? Uh, yeah, it's important. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so, okay, so, so uh, you know, after this processing by the transformer, what you can do is that now you can try to do, you know, uh, various classification tasks on the final token representation. Okay, so you had your sequence of token, it has been mapped to some new, you know, embedding, and on this new embedding, maybe you can do various kinds of linear regressions. So, okay. Yes. So, so far, there is no constraint on what kind of operators the beings are, like they could be full RAND, they could be whatever. Yeah, so again, in this multi-head, you know, attention, they map dimension D to dimension D over H. Okay, so they are rectangular like this. Okay. All right. So okay. So transformers, you know, I, I assume many of you have, have heard about it, but but if you haven't, you know, they have really uh, revolutionized NLP in the in the last five years. And in natural language processing, the way it works is that the token they correspond to word in a sentence. So really, the transformer is processing a sentence. And it's going to map, you know, the embedding of the sentence into a high dimension of space into another embedding, which takes into account the context of all the words, you know, in the sentence. So each token in NLP represents a word. That's a simplification. Really, it can represent a part of a word. This is the role of the tokenizer. It's, uh, you know, uh, a whole another thread, which we're not going to get into. And of course, you know, in a sentence, the order matters, right? You might have been surprised that I said that transformers are really just about sets. When you, know, when you read online, they will tell you they are about sequences. They're absolutely not about sequences, they are about sets. But the thing is, when you have a sequence, you can have a positional encoding. So you can also add to the token representation some information that tells you something about the position in the sentence, okay? So this is the role of the positional encoding. We're not gonna uh, talk about that uh, either. And then what you do is, you, know, you have this big uh, neural network and you're gonna train it on a variety of objectives. One of them is, for example, machine translation. Okay, so you take a, 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 a sentence in French and you want to map it to a sentence in English. Okay, and you have just a, an embedding of every vocabulary word, you know, every word in the vocabulary in French into a high dimensional vector, and the same thing in English. So it's really, you know, mapping a set of high dimensional vectors to another set of high dimensional vectors. It perfectly fits, you know, this, uh, this framework. Okay, so now let me tell you about some of the Keywords that you have, you might have heard, you know, in, in the past uh, five years. So some of the famous transformers models that are trained out there, okay? Because it's actually not easy to train those things. It takes a lot of effort. So there are not that many large scale transformer uh, out there. One of them is, is uh, BERT, okay? So this is one uh, that we're gonna focus on. By the way, I didn't really explain the point of my presentation. The point of my presentation is gonna be that, you know, this previous slide on transformer, it seems completely impossible to understand what they are doing. What are those different heads? What's the role of the feed forward neural network? Why do I have those many layers? How do those things interact with each other? It just seems like a huge mess. And the problem of the presentation is it's not a huge mess at all. Okay, we can really understand it uh, very well. So this is gonna be you know, what, I, what I will be talking about. And specifically, we will talk about BERT. So BERT is the encoder only architecture, which is great because that's the only thing I have explained. I have not explained really the decoder. And it's trained on this masked uh, language model. So it's not even machine translation. It's even easier. I have a sentence in English, and I'm just going to mask 10% you know, of the words. And my goal is to complete you know, those, those uh, masked uh, uh, tokens, okay? to just complete, the, to fill the blanks. Okay? 
So this is a model with depth 12, okay? It has 12 layers and 12 uh, heads, okay? And the dimensionality of uh, the embedding of the tokens is 768, okay? So the total is very easy calculation to do. I, I recommend doing it just to make sure that you understand every part of the transformer architecture. The number of parameters of this architecture is 110 uh, million, okay? Actually, this is not, you don't have enough information uh, to, to see 110 million because you also need to know the vocabulary size that is being using, used for the tokens, right? Because there is also part of the parameters is how do I embed, you know, my words in the English vocabulary into a vector in dimension 768, okay? So there are 30K, uh, this is 30K size uh, vocabulary. So the parameters are divided roughly one fourth in the attention, you know, in every layer, one fourth at the very beginning, just in the embedding of the, of, of the English, uh, you know, dictionary, and 50% in the feed forward neural network. This is BERT, okay, that, that's it, that's, that's BERT. GPT, okay, you all have heard about GPT-3, uh, or two maybe also. GPT is, it's a decoder uh, only architecture, okay, so it's only the other part. Decoder, by the way, it's, it's nothing magical. The only difference is that the attention, it has a causal structure. So basically you can only attend to things that are before you, okay? Which may or may not make sense, okay? And it's useful because then you can really produce one word by one word when you have this uh, causal structure. So for example, for machine translation, people do encoder decoder. You first encode your sentence in English, you know, using a, a, an encoder only architecture, and then you decode it into, you know, the target language, all right? So encoder decoder are for machine translation, GPD is for uh, language uh, generation, so it's decoder only, BERT is encoder only, okay. Now let me tell you some variants that are out there. A variant that I like is Albert. So it's like BERT, except that it's the same layer which is being repeated over and over again. So it's exactly the same architecture as BERT. It also has 12 layers, but those 12 layers are the same thing, okay? So I think from a theory perspective, it's very appealing. You're just repeating the same operation again and again, okay? Uh, Roberta, and the only uh, reason why I, I put it there is to put your attention on something very important. So BERT was uh, incredibly influential, and what Roberta is, is just a better trained version of BERT, okay? So, so understand that, you know, I don't talk about optimization at all. I don't explain, you know, uh, uh, how, how, you know, you choose the size of the mini batch and all of those things. All of this matters tremendously, and this is not going to appear in this presentation, but you see that there is research just even when you fix the model, how do you train it better? Like, how do you extract more out of the capabilities of this architecture? Is it the same data, same training data, just put into the... Uh... For Roberta, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. Uh, another type of research that people do, uh, this thing, Deberta, uh, you see that they are having fun with their names. Uh, so, so Deberta is this relative uh, positional uh, encoding and disentangle attention. Maybe I don't want to get into it uh, because anyway, I, I see that uh, I'm going slowly. Now, this goes way beyond uh, NLP. And of course, this goes way beyond NLP. This is about sets, okay? I mean, sets are every, like, there's nothing more basic than a set. So this can be applied everywhere. And it's just, you know, really changing the world. So, so for example, in reinforcement learning, you have decision transformers where, you know, your sequence is a, uh, the triplet uh, action, you know, uh, transition and, and, and reward. In vision, you can apply those things in vision with vision transformers. You can apply this in physics applications. Uh, you can have multimodal, uh, you know, uh, transformers where you have an encoder for the text and then you decode it into an image. You know, you translate from English to an image. This is really incredible. Uh, Clip, DALI, et cetera. And the reason why I, decided to, you know, uh, focus my research on this, uh, at least for a couple of years, is uh, the results are incredible. The results are just, just out of this world. So, you know, many of you probably saw this, maybe it was a month ago or a couple of weeks ago, uh, a Google engineer who thinks that, uh, you know, the company's AI has come to life and has become sentient. Of course, it's funny, but uh, the point is, even an engineer, like somebody, you know, reasonably trained in those things can get fooled by those systems. Those systems are so good at producing language that you feel like you're talking to, you know, a sentient being. I mean, this is just incredible. This example is from DALI 2, you know, 
This is a, a still of Kermit the Frog in Star Wars. So you give this as a, as a prompt, okay? This is, you know, your input sentence and it decodes it, encodes it and then decodes it into an image. And this is the image that is being produced. This is just, you know, like nobody, I think would have predicted this, uh, you know, six months ago. This is really, really incredible. I mean, you understand like just to, I mean, you understand, it's just crazy. So, uh, and you know, you might say, oh, maybe this was cherry picked. So this is an example, you know, uh, uh, that was uh, that I asked them to produce for me. And so, you know, it's not cherry picked at all. This is the first thing that the uh, model produced. So this is something I wanted uh, for a long time, a bandit writing mathematical equation on the blackboard, you know, anime style. I wish I, you know, uh, a long time ago, I wanted to ask an artist to draw something like that, but I was just lazy. But now I can just ask, you know, the model and in five seconds, it produces this image. So of course it's not perfect. And, you know, if I spent more time, you know, with the prompt and, and modifying it, you know, I would get, I think, something uh, really great. But already this, I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I mean, at least it's correct, you know? At least it's correct. Uh, that's, that's already pretty good. No, but, but look, look, it puts a chalk in the hand of the bandit. I mean, this, this, is, this is crazy, you know? It has to understand that the chalk, you know, gets into the hand and, you know, you have the chalk that touches the blackboard. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Okay, good. Um, so, so, okay, good. They are, they are amazing. So what, what's really good about transformer? Why are they uh, different from previous neural networks? So to me, the reason why they are really good is that to me, they are relative neural network as, as opposed to, you know, absolute neural network, which would be fit for one neural network on convolutional neural network. And what I mean by that is in traditional neural network, you learn the neurons and the neurons are kind of fixed filters you know against which you're going to test your data so you have your x and you're going to test it against you know this fixed filter is there a cat in my image is there a dog in my image so you have learned these fixed filters in transformers you're testing your input against itself so you you really you know it, it has it has a, a a lot more in it you can start to do reasoning okay so what i want to say is you know that this allows for potentially allows for reasoning to emerge because now you can associate concepts you know, for example, you can try to do analogies like if concept A behaves, you know, in such and such ways and concept B is similar to A in such and such ways, then something happens. And this is really about, you know, A and B are embedded in your, you know, input. These are not abstract things in absolute terms. These are all relative terms. Okay, this is really the basis of, of, of reasoning to me. Uh, maybe, you know, if I wanted to be... Uh, like more concrete, you know, you can imagine, say I have an image and I want to know if this image contains two items which are the same. So in convolutional neural network, what you would do is you would test against all, you know, the, the dictionary of filters that you have learned. Okay, maybe you know about cats, you know about tables, you know about dogs, etc. And you're gonna see, okay, is there two cats or is there two dogs, etc. But transformers, they are much more clever. They can really just test, you know, is there two parts of the image that are the same directly? So it's like more, more powerful in a way. So of course, you know, this is great. This is a, a nice story, but we would like to understand this in a more scientific way, okay? We would like to understand those transformers, you know, how do they learn exactly? What is the role of the different attention heads? Can they really learn reasoning? You know, things like that. So this is now where uh, Lego is gonna help us. So Lego is this new uh, synthetic task that we have designed to kind of, you know, try to, as a sort of microscope into transformer learning, okay? So let me explain to you what is uh, LEGO. It stands for learning equality and, and group operations. So let's, let's just be general, you know, I will define it as a problem. So let G be a, a group, okay, a finite group. It doesn't really need to be a group, but let's just say a group. And you have a finite set X, okay? So X is gonna be your set of values and G is gonna be the set of operations that they can do on this set X. And I'm also gonna have a set A, which is a finite alphabet. And this set A is gonna be my set of abstract variables, okay? So the set A is gonna be variables that to which I can assign meaning that are values in X, okay? Now we're gonna have a sentence. A sentence in Lego is as follows. So it's made of clauses and each clause looks like this. It just looks like A equals GX. Okay, and A is of course a variable, A is, is in capital A, G is a group operation, and little x, it's either a value or it's a variable. 
So if little x is a value in capital X, then the meaning of this should be clear to everyone. The meaning is in the variable A, I put the value G of X. This is the meaning, okay? If little x was itself a variable, then the meaning is if there is some other clause that assigns some values to little x, then I should, you know, by, you know, transitivity, assign to little a the value of g applied to this value of the variable x, which is assigned by somebody else, okay? All right. Now, given such a sentence, you know, you have many clauses like that. The goal is going to be to find the value that satisfy all the clauses. Okay, so it's a very simple type of, of, of reasoning. So let me just give you a, a, an example just to make sure that we are on the same page. So we're going to focus on the simplest case. Okay, and if you, if you ask me, I, I, I can tell you about a more complicated case, but we're going to focus on the simplest possible case, which is the group of two elements, okay, acting on itself. So G is just, you know, minus and plus. Capital X is minus one and plus one. And A is whatever. It's just a Latin alphabet. So a sentence looks like this. A is equal to plus one. That's kind of my initial assignment, if you wish. So in the variable A, I say the value should be plus one. And plus one, understand, it's like plus is a group operation and one is the value, you know, one, okay? Now I say B is equal to minus A. Okay, so now you have to, you know, associate concept. You have to say, ah, okay, so A was plus one. So if B is minus A, that means B is minus one. Then C is equal to plus D. Ah, so that's already more complicated. Okay, I don't know what is D. I have to find, you know, the value of D first. Okay, D is equal to plus B, but B was equal to minus one. So I, I know that D is minus one. So, okay, now I know that C is minus one. Okay, so you see, you have to do this, this kind of, uh, you know, for loop reasoning to resolve the value of all the variables. Okay, so, so this resolves into uh, one minus one minus one minus one. Okay, is the, is the task uh, clear? Now what we're gonna do is that we're gonna try to see how transformers fare on this task. Okay, we're just gonna try to analyze and we're gonna try to see, okay, what is the role of the fit forward? What is the role of the different heads? And, and, and all of that good stuff, okay? What, yes? Uh, can the set of constraints be unsatisfiable in general? No, no, no. So, so I, I, I will show you a picture of the kind of, you know, set of clauses that we do, but it's basically just a, a line graph. So you always have a root, which assign an initial value, and then everything is in the line, you know. You just have to follow the chain of reasoning. Okay. So, so in fact, there's only a unique solution. There is a unique solution. Absolutely, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so just to be clear, you know, you have your input sentence, D equals, uh, you know, minus C, B equals blah, blah, blah. You know, then the transformer processes it, and then you have a, a linear classification head on top of every variable, and that's where you have your loss function. Okay, and, and the point, the key point is that you have to be able to associate concepts, okay? Which means that if you have A that appears in two different places in the sentence, then you have to realize those two different A's, they are the same thing, right? This is not at all obvious. So if A, you know, over there, I say it's minus one, then this A, you know, when I say B is equal to minus, minus A, then this, you know, A over there is also minus one. So that means B is plus one. So you have to associate a uh, concept and you have to manipulate them, okay? Manipulate them because again, if B is minus A and A was minus one, I have to say, okay, I have to manipulate my minus one to turn it into a plus one, okay? So you have this association operation and manipulation operation, okay? All right. So the point is association and manipulation, they are very easy to implement with the attention, okay? Why is that? So let's just, let's just see that. And I should try to go a little bit faster. So let's say you have uh, two, you know, occurrences of the token Z, okay? Z is some variable, okay? And currently they're embedding, so they are being processed by the network. And currently the token, you know, representation are different. One of them is alpha plus beta, and the other one is alpha plus gamma, okay? So Z has been processed into two different things. Understand that, of course, on the very first layer, Z is embedded into the high dimensional, the same high dimensional vector. But as soon as there is an attention operation, because of the positional encoding, they are going to evolve differently. Okay. And now let's assume maybe that no other token contains alpha. Then what happens is that, of course, the attention is going to be very simple because if you have a head which has WK equals WQ equals identity. Okay. So again, this is where you see the importance of, you know, 
the, the value of those uh, linear operators. So if the key and queries are just identity, then you're just comparing, you know, taking the inner product of the tokens themselves. So because no other tokens contain alpha, and if you assume everything is random, which of course it's not, but let's assume it is random, then you see that the two occurrence of Z in this head, they are just going to attend to each other. So this Z over here, which is alpha plus beta, and this Z over there, which is alpha plus gamma, their attention is to each other, okay? So they are just going to mix the value of those tokens. If, for example, you know the value uh, matrix WV is also identity, then after the self-attention, those two tokens, they just become two alpha plus beta plus gamma. Yes? Right, you, you can think like that. And, and, and maybe one thing I can say now is the layer normalization will make sure that these are unit norms, uh, you know, vectors. So, so there are unit norm vectors. And yeah, what I'm assuming is basically, you know, that beta and gamma and the other tokens are kind of random on the sphere and you know, independent of alpha. And so you have this, you know, common direction that makes, you know, those two tokens uh, attend to each other. Yes? Uh, the constraint, you mean uh, uh, you mean this like? Oh, oh, so so each symbol is a token. So you know, I have an embedding. Okay, so just to be clear, I have an embedding for the group operation minus. I have an embedding for the group operation plus. I have an embedding for the value minus one. I have an embedding for the value plus one, and I have an embedding for the twenty-six letter in the Latin alphabet. Yeah, 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 there is, of course, you absolutely need positional encoding here. Yes. Right, there is also an, right, there is also an embedding for equal sign and for the comma. <coughs> uh, no, 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 no. This is a token, 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 this is a token. Okay, good. All right, so let, let, let's go to the experiments uh, maybe quickly. Uh, and, and manipulation, okay, maybe I just want to say that. So, you know, association is easily done with the uh, uh, with a head, which would have identity for the, you know, three linear operators. For manipulation, you can use the fit forward neural network. Because imagine if a token, it has in it, you know, that it came from a, a minus one value, and there is a minus operation in it, then I could have, you know, in my fit forward, I could say, if I have, you know, in my token, a minus one and a minus group operation, then I, what I should output is a value plus one. Okay, it's very easy to see that you can do that. And in fact, let me just make a comment that it's even easier to do that with gated linear units. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. But, but this is where you can start to see differences between, for example, different nonlinearities, uh, which I find to be interesting. The, the fit network, is it on each token separately? Or yes, separately? each token separately. That's the key point is that the associate. Yeah, yeah, so you need, so for manipulation, you need, okay, maybe I, I went too fast. For manipulation, it's very important. You should also have a head that mixes in, you know, the token nearby. Okay. So maybe this is key. Okay. You, you need to have a manip, so basically what this slide is saying is all you need is a manipulation head and an association head. And if you have those two things, then you should be able to solve you know, uh, as a Lego task. Okay, so let's see, uh, <coughs> sorry, let's see how transformers uh, actually do on this task. So this is an example. And what I want to clarify is that there is a, an order of reasoning. Okay, so let's say A equals plus one, B equals minus A, E equals plus B, D equals minus F. You see, uh, uh, let me just see, F, F, we don't know what is the value yet. F is given by the last clause, which is plus E. But in the chain of reasoning order, you know, you have A, B, E, F, D, C. Okay, so in the order, I'm going to say that A is the first variable, B is the second one, E is the third one, etc. Is that uh, clear? Okay, so now I'm going to show you how transformers, how BERT uh, learns on, 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 on this. And we're going to be running on sequences of length 12. Okay, there will be 12 uh, variables. So <laughs> this is what happened. <clears throat> it works, okay? So this is a test accuracy. 
This is the number of epochs. It shoots up to 100% accuracy on all the variables. You know, praise the deep learning gods. It's magic. It's wonderful. You know, it's really great. And you see, like, it's really as this, you know, kind of eureka moment. Suddenly it gets it and it predicts, you know, perfectly. It's really wonderful. Okay, good. Uh, we can stop here. Uh, so, <laughs> of course not. Okay, so what this is, I will call this classical generalization. You have trained on sequences of 12 variables and you're testing on sequences of 12 variables. But really what you would like to understand is whether the transformers has understood how to do reasoning. Okay, that's the whole spiel of those, you know, models is that they understand at a more ab abstract level. So can I maybe train on only six variables and, you know, test on 12 variables and see whether it can, you know, generalize, like do this out of distribution generalization. Okay, it has really understood how to do the for loop to solve the Lego task. Okay, so the way we're going to do that because of the positional encoding, you can't be stupid and you can't just you know, feed sequences with six variables and then test on sequences with 12 variables because the positional encoding has never, if it has never seen sequences of length 12, it will just fail. Okay, so what we're going to do is that we're going to feed sequences of length 12, but we're only going to provide supervision at training time on the first half. Okay, so for example, in this sequence, what I mean is that in tr at training time in blue, you're only going to provide a, a loss on the first three variables and no loss on the last three variables. Okay. But you do need to use the, I mean, in training times, you still need to use the remaining ones. To yeah, yeah, they are there. The, the, the network is. Reasoning, right? I mean, it's not that there's a problem in the first three from the framework. Like you are. So, okay, okay, that, that's a good question. So the point is, no, you don't need to, to resolve the last, you know, to, to resolve the beginning, but, so, so but the, you, yeah, it is the case in all my examples. So the point is that there is a chain order and there is a sentence order, but because the network does not know the chain order, you know, so finding the chain order is kind of already reason, you know, solving part of the reasoning. So, so, you know, all it can really do is just, Solve the problem. I'm confused. You're going to give supervision on the purpose of the chain or purpose of the sentence? Excellent. On the chain. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise it would be stupid. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, it wouldn't make sense otherwise. It's on the order of the chain. Yes. Okay. And lo and behold, it doesn't work. So it, it doesn't generalize. Okay. So in, in dashed, you can see, you know, how well it does in this out of distribution generalization. And it just doesn't learn, you see? It gets 100% accuracy on what it was trained on. But if you just ask it you know, to predict a chain one step longer, it kind of fails. I mean, it gets to 70% uh, uh, accuracy. OK, so transformers are not just you know, this magical hammer that you can apply to any problem, and it's going to solve uh, everything. But maybe what you can do is you can apply a better inductive bias, OK? Which is, of course, machine learning 101. You, know? you want to have uh, inductive bias in your in your uh, training. And Lego is really about a for loop. And the Albert architecture that I told you about, where you repeat the same layer over and over again, this is also you know, a for loop kind of architecture. So maybe Albert is going to generalize better than BERT. And indeed, it does. Okay? So on the top, it's a classical uh, generalization. And on the bottom, it's the out of distribution generalization. So you see from the left side is BERT, and right side is Albert. So you see from classical generalization, you cannot distinguish Bert and Albert. But in out of distribution generalization, it's extremely clear. Albert is solving the problem much, much, much better. I mean, the generalization to one more um, step is 100%. To two more steps, it gets to 100%. To three more steps, it gets to you know, the 70%. So it just works much, much, much better. And realize that Albert has much fewer parameters. Okay? only 30 million, and most of them are in the embedding, actually. So it has very, very few parameters compared to BERT 110 uh, million. So, so, you know, the inductive bias is still, it's still there. It still matters a lot. Yes. One quick question. Is this 11 at all related to the number of layers in Albert? For example, <laughs> the number of variables was much larger than the number of layers. Would you expect the same thing? I, I, I will come back to this question at the end, um, but it's an excellent question. Yes. The short answer is yes. We, we decided, you know, 12 and 12, just to make sure, you know, that at least this part is taken care of, but, but there's more to be said. Yeah. Yes? Uh, 
so the, you see the dashed curves. These are, this is the last half of the chain. So the dashed curve are those that are not getting to 100%. This is a true generalization, really, whether you have understood the concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, these, these are excellent questions. So I, uh, I, will, I will try to answer this also uh, at the end. Okay. Okay, so a, a better inductive uh, bias help. Now, I would like to uh, point something out. I don't know if yeah, it doesn't work. So look at something funny. So let's look at, at these curves uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay, I know I don't have an hour in front of me, so I can't you know, explain everything that I wanted, but let's, let's just go slowly for a minute. So let's look at Albert. Uh, you know, and Bert has, has the same phenomenon. And let's look at, you know, the curves, how they go up and look at the colors, okay? So the first one that go up, you know, it's variable zero, which is the first variable in the chain. It makes sense. You know, you just said A equals plus one, you know, the prediction on A is the first one that gets to hundred percent. That makes sense. The second one is the variable uh, one, but look at who becomes third. Who is the, you know, next variable that you predict to hundred percent accuracy. It's the last variable. Okay, so you have this chain of reasoning. You first predict correctly the first one, then the second, then the last. Uh, does anyone see why? I mean, wait, this is really a case where, you know, we saw those plots and we were like, what's going on? I mean, how, how on earth uh, does it work? So it took us a few minutes, so. So how is it possible? Like, it, it really says, you understand, it says that it's finding the value of the last variable before it has found the value of the other variables. Yes, yeah, okay. This is also another question, uh, the variance of those plots, but yes, it's regardless of the, of the random initialization, yes. So it's almost that. Um, so what happens is there is a shortcut in this problem. Namely, you know, if I, uh, let me show you here, if I want to predict the value of C, what I can do is I can just count the number of minuses because it's just a multiplication. It's just plus times minus times plus times minus. So all the pluses, I don't care. I only care about the number of minuses. I only care about the parity of the minuses of the number of minuses. That's all that matters to predict the last variable. And the last variable is also the only variable that appears only once in the chain. So it's very easy for the network to check, okay, which is the variable that appears only once. And to this variable, I'm just gonna count the number of minuses, take the parity, and this is the value that I'm gonna assign. So there is a shortcut, okay, which is not what humans, you know, would do to solve this problem. And those networks, they find this shortcut, okay? So of course, uh, you know, this, this, this shortcut, it should be very bad for generalization because you understand computing the parity like it's, it's not at all going to work for generalization for out of distribution generalization. If I, you know, learn the parity on six bits, it tells me nothing about the parity on 12 bits. Okay. I just, it's not a, 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 a solution that generalizes and it's a real thing. Like the transformer just finds that. Okay. So the thing is you don't see it in this plot that it's terrible for generalization. Why is that? It's because in this setup of the experiment, you see that, you know, the end of the supervision, it's a variable that appears twice. So in this setup, there is no shortcut because this variable in the middle does not appear twice. So one way to test what I'm telling you is to run again this experiment, but to also provide supervision on the last variable. So what happens if I, put, if I give supervision on the first six variable and the last variable? Okay, this is a... Uh, a, a question and you will see what happens. So let me show you. Um, so you understand, I'm just providing more information. Okay, so this slide is just, uh, uh, is just everything that I should, told you that there is a shortcut and it should be disastrous for generalization, but we cannot see in the previous plot. So let's see if we just add supervision to variable 11, we strictly give more information. Uh, so let me see what are we looking at, right? So the bottom plot is if we just uh, give supervision of the first five variables and the top plot is if we give supervision on the first five variables plus the last variable. Okay, so the top one has strictly more information and it's doing much worse. 
I mean, look at like look at Bert. It's very very clear, and you can see the green the green you know curve. It's it's shooting up in the top one. It's finding the shortcut and it's hurting your generalization. Okay, so I I think you know one takeaway here is a classical generalization can be misleading in many many ways. Okay, there's the shortcut uh, solution. Uh, you know, there is a fact that it doesn't tell you anything about out of distribution generalization. You know, this is the sentence that's important. There is no inductive bias towards human-like solution, right? You, you see this chain of reasoning and you think, okay, you have to fill in, you know, one by one. But in fact, there can be other ways to solve the problem. And those transformers might find those other ways. So it's actually important to really think about the inductive bias and try to, you know, implement inductive bias in those. Okay, I'm going to take five minutes. Okay, I'm going to finish in five minutes. Uh, maybe uh, let's let's keep drilling on the inductive uh, bias. So here is one thing that you can do, which is related, I think, to some of the comments that were uh, made. So another basic observation that you can make for Lego is that variables early in the chain they should be resolved also early in the processing. Okay. So what you could do is this type of early exit strategy, where you stop, you know, the processing early, and you see, okay, where can I already predict some of the variables? Basically, you want to prevent the network from waiting at the last moment to resolve everything, because that would be a very non-human-like solution. So you can do this idea of uh, stochastic depth, and you see it works great. Uh, I mean, there's nothing else to say. Uh, it, just, it just works uh, uh, really well. So here you see with stochastic depth, it just beats uh, the Albert uh, strategy. Okay, that's all I wanted to say on inductive bias. Now, very quickly, in the last five minutes, I'm going to tell you about pre-training and uh, you know, the, the, the role of the different attention heads. So if there is anyone you know, versed in deep learning in, in the room, uh, you should tell me that I'm doing it all wrong. The right way to do deep learning is to pre-train the transformer on a huge corpus and then fine tune on the tasks that you care about. This is the way you do deep learning. You don't you know, start from scratch on your task. Okay? And that's why, you know, your network are not solving the problem. That's why BERT is not working. It's because you don't take a randomly initialized BERT. You take the BERT that was trained on Wikipedia, and then you fine tune it on Lego. So at first, you know, when you say that, it doesn't make any sense. Like, how would, you know, pre-training on Wikipedia help me to solve, you know, this chain of reasoning? Unless, you know, there is some magical thing going on where really the network, you know, by reading Wikipedia, it has learned to reason or something, you know? So, so it doesn't make any sense, uh, but it works. It really works. So, so on the left is the BERT, randomly initialized BERT, and on the right is the pre-trained BERT, pre-trained on Wikipedia and fine-tuned on Lego. And look at how much better it is. I mean, it's better than any other product I have shown you so far, except maybe stochastic depth with Albert. Yes. What, what does that mean? Pre-trained on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, what it means is very simple. So you have this BERT architecture with twelve layers, etc. And you first train it to predict, you know, you, you feed it Wikipedia in the following sense. You feed a sentence of Wikipedia and you mask like 10% of the words and you make it predict, you know, what were those missing words. And you do that for many, many epochs with lots of compute. Now you have a network, which is fixed, which has been pre-trained. And now you're going to use this as an initialization for this task. Okay, so this is the pre-trained fine-tuned uh, thing. And it works really great, you know. And so, you know, again, here, uh, I think the answer should be, you know, uh, praise the deep learning God. It's, it's incredible. It works uh, really well. But uh, the thing is, there is really, as always, there is no magic in life, sadly. Uh, there is a very simple explanation for what's going on. What's going on is simply that, uh, it's simply this. It's simply that these are attention heads map. Okay, I won't have time to explain them in detail. But basically what they represent, this is a manipulation head that I was telling you, and this is the association head that I was telling you. So pre-trained BERT has found this kind of you know, convolutional structure, which is what I call the manipulation head, and it has found this kind of identity you know, uh, linear operator, which I call the association head, and it just has found this you know, naturally. And if you initialize with them, then it's going to be much easier to solve LEGO. And you can test this hypothesis by just saying, okay, let me try to mimic you know, the pre-training by just initializing with those 
two heads, you know, association and manipulation, which I have learned, you know, to mimic basically what the pre-training does. And you can see that mimicking does almost as well as, as pre-trained. And mimicking, understand, this is like a, a zero data initialization, okay? The middle, the middle plot is pre-trained on all of Wikipedia. The, the right one, it, it has zero, you know, since zero data. It, ju it has just learned to do this manipulation and, you know, association head. So really, there's no magic. Pre-training is just finding those good operators. So okay. No, 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 it, no, no. <coughs> that would be too much. No, no. <laughs> it's uh, the initialization is a mimicking of those two heads that I showed you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to conclude now, but. Uh, so, of course, you know, the question is is this a more general phenomenon? Is it that pre training just finds general purpose operators that can be fine tuned uh, on specific tasks? Okay, so maybe language models are not impossible to understand. Uh, we could try to use those uh, for pruning for many, many other things. You can try to look at the importance of data, longer chain, you know, different depths of the network, more complex groups. This is one picture that's related to some of the questions that were asked. If you train <coughs> on much longer chain, and you can see this is still depth 12, but you can see how much better it does. So basically, by seeing more complex data, it learns a better, you know, uh, model. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Sorry for going over time. <laughs>